I want to talk now briefly about inflation and unemployment. Now we've got to get it straight that inflation is a continuous increase in prices, not a once-off increase in prices. Now inflation can arise in a number of ways. And one of the important insights if you study history is a lot of uh, movements in price levels are derived from administrative decisions of government. So excise duties, health insurance type pricing decisions have nothing to do with the state of the economy. And we get seduced into thinking, oh, inflation's rising, but it's really because of annual government decisions to index various prices in the economy. But in general, economists distinguish between what they call demand pull inflation, which is excessive nominal spending in the economy. In other words, when total spending outstrips the capacity of the economy to produce real goods and services. The only way out is to push up prices. And the other way inflation can arise is through what we call cost push inflation. And that is that there's a, some raw material price rise, for example, pushes up business costs. And then there's a unholy war between labor and capital as to who's going to bear the real losses associated with that raw material price rise. And so the traditional way of thinking about these things was in what was called the Phillips curve, which was introduced in 1958 to macroeconomics. And this was a diagram that alleged that there was a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So that if you had lower unemployment, that would push up cost pressures through wage demands and increase spending because incomes in the economy would be higher and so inflation would rise. And so there was a big industry in government policy making as to what was the optimal trade-off between the two evils, inflation and unemployment. Well then that framework was then taken on by the monetarists in the late 1960s and in the growing sort of neoliberal attacks on government to deny that there was a trade-off and claim that there was only one unemployment rate, the so-called natural rate, that would be consistent with stable inflation. And that if governments tried to drive that natural rate down using fiscal policy expansion, then all they would do would create inflation. Now, it was a pretty erroneous analysis, but it had great political weight and became the dominant paradigm in economic policy making. Now in modern monetary theory, there is no natural rate of unemployment. We believe that there's only an irreducible minimum rate of unemployment. And the way we analyse inflation is to compare two buffer stock mechanisms, which we'll talk about in a subsequent video. And those two buffer stocks are either you use an unemployment approach to discipline inflation, which is massively costly, or you use an alternative of an employment buffer stock, a job guarantee. Now the last thing I want to talk about here is the fear that's constantly invoked when governments run deficits. And that's the Zimbabwe, Weimar Republic, hyperinflation fear. We're led to believe that when governments run deficits continuously, that eventually you'll get hyperinflation because there'll be too much money circulating, chasing too few goods, and wow. Well, take Zimbabwe for an example. If you understand history, Zimbabwe had hyperinflation for sure, but why did it have hyperinflation? And the historical understanding will lead you to know that Robert Mugabe wanted to reward his freedom fighters who freed the country from the colonial white rulers. And at the same time, during the colonial white regime, land equity was dramatically unequal. In other words, most of the land was owned by the whites. And what Robert Mugabe did, for good reasons, was a disastrous policy intervention. He gave the white farms, which had, were highly productive, and the food bowl of Africa, he gave them to the freedom fighters who knew nothing about farming. And as a consequence, agricultural output collapsed in Zimbabwe, modern Zimbabwe. And then to solve the food crisis, the central bank restricted the foreign currency that they would previously make available to manufacturers to import capital equipment. 
And so manufacturing started to falter as well. And so when you've got a collapse of production and pr productive capacity, we call that a supply shock. And it wouldn't have mattered if the Zimbabwean government had even been running fiscal surpluses, you still would have got hyperinflation because of a dramatic contraction in the supply capacity. And so the Zimbabwe example, and similarly what happened in the 1920s in Germany, those examples provide no understanding, no knowledge of what happens in a normal situation where a government's running fiscal deficits and supply is growing as investment grows. Mm -hmm.